Welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, where she called us to live to a higher standard each day, not settling for a shallow substitute instead of God's best for our lives. As this podcast series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from family, friends, and others who are influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Today's podcast is called God is in Control. It features, as usual, two Gateway to Joy programs, Letting God Be God and A Weight of Glory. Also, we'll hear from uh, a couple people. Donna Otto was a good friend of Elizabeth. Uh, She takes a minute and a half or so to tell us about a few things that Elizabeth did not like. Louisa May Alcott. (laughs) said that the two most beautiful words in the English language are, come in. Come in. Have you ever had someone say that to you? Come in, come in for tea, come in for lunch. Well, I think that one of my fondest remembrances of Elizabeth is how often she invited me to come in. Come into her home, come into her family, come into her friendships, come into her life. And I was grateful to accept the invitation each time. Now, we had some things in common, Elizabeth and I. Um, They were more on the plebeian side. I hate to shop. I don't like small talk. I despise unruly, childish behavior, whether you're a child or an adult. And I don't like fast food. And so um, Elizabeth and I had these things in common. And yet I remember one day in a very noisy mall full of unruly children eating fast food. She leaned into me and she said to me, I've been given many gifts, but the gift that you have given me in your love for Walt and Val and my grandchildren, at that time there were only six of you, is an extraordinary gift. And I took that as a rare treasure. Donna Otto. We'll also hear from Eileen Chambers, longtime friend, a screenwriter, and somebody who's been working with Valerie in connection with her book, Devotedly. But let's get to that Gateway to Joy program I mentioned, Letting God Be God. You know, when those five missionary men were killed, there was a flood of mail, a lot of editorializing, there was some secular support, maybe even respect for those who would give their lives on behalf of their beliefs. But there was some disturbing response from Christian publications. If five men would willingly shed their blood, would that guarantee that a church would be established among the Alcas? Think about that with us today. Gateway to Joy 99, Letting God Be God. When my husband Jim Elliott was killed in Ecuador, the news traveled around the world. It was not just Jim, it was five people that were killed at the same time, but there was a flood of mail that came to us widows, and there was a lot of editorializing. To my surprise, there was not very much editorializing in the secular press, other than an expression of simple respect for men who would die for what they believed. Not that people understood what it was they believed or were sympathetic with it, but it's always heartening to know that there are people who believe something sincerely enough and with strong enough commitment to actually give their lives for it. There are not very many things worth dying for, and if a thing is not worth dying for, it's really not worth living for either, is it? We frequently forget that. But I must confess that I was disturbed by some of the editorializing which appeared in Christian publications. The reason I was disturbed is because there seemed to be an underlying glibness, a certain pat answer to the death of these men, which was, to many of us, a great mystery. There was the assumption that the purposes of God are very plain in a case like this. We heard again and again the old saying, which is very true, 
that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I believed that. I was not irritated by that. But does this mean, then, that if five men shed their blood, that there would be an Alka church someday? And I puzzled over that when I thought, do I trust God only conditionally, that if he does what I think he's supposed to do, which is to save the Alcas, then he is God. And if he does not save the Alcas, then he's not God, and I can't really trust him. Or the other question that came to my mind was, what if nobody gets saved? What if no other missionary ever goes to the Alcas? What if there's never an Alca church? What will these same people who editorialized so glibly have to say about that? You know, Jesus had some rather stern things to say about those who always required signs. Paul said the Greeks seek after wisdom and the Jews require signs. And there are those today who look for thrills, for prosperity, for health, for wealth, and the gospel that is being preached by some is a gospel of prosperity. Do this, and God will do that for you. Give your money here, and God will multiply it a hundredfold and give you more money than you've ever had in your life. I believe that we're to let God be God. Sometimes he does things the way we expect him to, and sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes what we've prayed for has been answered exactly as we hoped, and very often it's not. Well, for whom did those five missionaries go when they went to take the gospel to the Alcas? For the Alcas, of course, but not primarily. They went primarily in obedience to God. The truth is that not one of them ever had the opportunity to witness about Jesus Christ to those Alcas because they couldn't speak their language. It's difficult for people to grasp nowadays that anybody cares that much about anything, especially if it's invisible. Is there anything that you think is worth dying for? If you have trouble answering that question, then I would ask, what do you live for? If what you live for is not worth dying for, then it's not worth living for. God is God. In his will is my peace. And that peace is infinitely, immeasurably, and unspeakably beyond my imaginations. I think that I had been able to understand just about all the peace that I had ever had up until the time when my husband was killed. And it was in that worst possible experience, the worst thing that I could imagine happening to me then, that I discovered that the peace of God which passes all understanding is not a myth. It really does exist. Now the Alka story, which turned out so differently from what we had hoped and prayed, was a part of God's story. But it was only a tiny part. It made thundering headlines, it made a tremendous impact in the Christian church, and it continues to do so. I continue to get letters and phone calls and meet people whose lives have been changed through the death of those men. And I can see that God's story goes on and on. But it was only one small incident in the history of the Christian church, and there have been tens of thousands of martyrs Strangely enough, there had been five young men killed in the jungles of Bolivia by a savage tribe just a few years before the incident in Ecuador, and hardly anybody had heard about it. It had seemed to make hardly any impact at all. Your story, what's your story about? It's part of God's story too, isn't it? God does have a plan for your life. There is a purpose behind it all. Everything that happens fits into a pattern for good. You may feel that your story is not at all dramatic, but remember that it's just as vital and just as decisive 
in the whole divine tapestry which God is at work on now. I think of the incident in the Old Testament, in the book of Samuel, which tells about the young man Saul being sent out to look for his father's lost donkeys. Now those donkeys had wandered away, and you can imagine what a nuisance it is if your animals get out of the fence or away from wherever they were supposed to be. And so Kish, the father of Saul, sent him out to look for the donkeys. And Saul took along a servant, and as they were looking for the donkeys, they found some girls drawing water. And they asked them about a certain prophet that the servant knew about, if he happened to be nearby, and the girls said, yes, there's a feast going on up at the hill shrine, and if you will go up there now, you will find the prophet there. And they went, and sure enough, the feast was going on, and sure enough, the prophet Samuel was there. And the prophet Samuel had received a message just the day before that he was to anoint Saul prince. As far as we know, God didn't tell him that he was going to find Saul at the hill shrine. But think back over the details of that story, which is a part of God's story that has been preserved for us in a book called the Bible. The details. The donkeys got lost. When did they get lost? Well, right at the time of the feast at the hill shrine. So what happened when the donkeys got lost? Well, Kish sends his son out and says, go find them. Saul goes out, takes a servant along. Perhaps he had several servants to choose from, but the one that he chose happened to know about the existence of a man named Samuel who might be able to give them some help in finding these animals. They find some girls drawing water just at that precise moment. Well, the girls undoubtedly drew water every day from the same place, but not all day every day. And just as Saul and his servant came along, there they were, drawing water. So they asked them, do you know about a prophet named Samuel? And they just happened to know. Are these coincidences? The girls told them where to go. They went up to the hill shrine. It happened to be at just the time of the feast, and Samuel the prophet happened to be there. And so because some donkeys wandered away, Saul was anointed king of Israel. God is at work on an intricate pattern. He who choreographs the stars in their courses also is in charge of the tiniest details of our lives. If God were not in charge of the little things, he couldn't be in charge of the big things. Let's not give way to the urge to oversimplify, to explain, to demonstrate, to prove. Often people ask me, how many Alcas are Christians? I tell them I don't know. Well, didn't they all get saved? Didn't I hear that all the men that killed the five missionaries got saved? And I say, well, perhaps you did. I'm really not very sure about that, but I can leave it in God's hands. I believe there are Christians there. I believe that God is at work among the Alcas. But if there were no Alca church, not one Alca believer, could I still believe that God knew exactly what he was doing when he took my husband? I can, because he's God, because his promises are there, and because the part of faith is to leave things where they belong, in God's hands. It is the part of faith to try to find their meaning, but I must find the meaning in God himself, not necessarily in a particular outcome which I expect. It's my job to conform myself to his loving purpose, and then everything that happens fits into a pattern for good to those who love God. Gateway to Joy 99, Letting God Be God. Normally, we have two Gateway to Joy programs on this podcast, and we still have Gateway to Joy 100 coming up called A Weight of Glory. You know, there were bags of mail from comforters, people who were shocked to hear the news of the death of Jim Elliott and the others. There were two verses especially that comforted the widows. Hear about those today, about troubles being slight and short-lived. 
What would you say to somebody who had just lost a loved one, in this case a husband? Do those troubles seem slight? Is there really a point to this suffering? The first time I was widowed, I received bags of mail from people trying to comfort me, telling me they were praying for me, telling me how shocked they had been to hear my husband's death. He was 28 years old. I was 29. But of all the letters that came, I think the one that stands out in my mind is the one that quotes two verses from 2 Corinthians. And those are the verses that I have most often given to other widows when I've had opportunity to try to comfort them. This is what Paul says to the Corinthian church. Our troubles are slight and short-lived, and their outcome an eternal glory which outweighs them far. Meanwhile, our eyes are fixed not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For what is seen passes away. What is unseen is eternal. And I ponder those words over and over again. Our troubles are slight and short-lived. Would you say that to a widow? Your troubles are slight? Well, that's probably not the first thing that you would think of saying, and if you did think of it, you'd probably keep your mouth shut. Because to one who has just been bereaved, their troubles seem enormous, life-changing. And on that scale of traumas or stress factors, I think losing a loved one is at the very top. So our troubles do not seem slight and short-lived at the time, but remember who's writing this. It's not a man who knew nothing about suffering. The Apostle Paul had been through a lot. Shipwrecks, starving, imprisonments, public floggings. He had a long list of trials and tribulations that really makes mine look like practically nothing. And it was Paul who was able to say, our troubles are slight and short-lived. But that's not very much comfort. It's the next part that's comfort. Their outcome. So they have an outcome? You mean there's a point to this? There's a purpose? You mean it's not for nothing? I'm not at the mercy of chance? What does he say? Their outcome is an eternal glory, or as another translation puts it, a weight of glory. In other words, Paul is using the metaphor of a scales, an old-fashioned scales, in which you have two pans balanced on a fulcrum. And you put weights on one side and whatever it is you're trying to weigh on the other side. So here... We are to put the weight of glory, which he doesn't define, something mysterious, something heavenly, something invisible. You put that on one side, and on the other pan, just load all your troubles. Are you bereaved? Are you sick? Have you lost a job? Have you lost your health? Have you lost your self-respect? Have you lost your husband by divorce? What is it that is the weight of trouble that bears you down today? Put it in the other pan and look what happens. He says their outcome will be a weight of glory that outweighs them far. In other words, all the hurts we've ever suffered, all the losses, all the bereavement, all the trials, all the horrible things that have happened to us, they will look like nothing when we get that weight of glory on the other side. It's going to make that pan with all our troubles in it just fly up as if it had nothing in it but feathers. That's the picture he's giving us. There's going to be an eternal weight of glory. And it says that these troubles are actually working for us an eternal weight of glory. I was amazed at those words. It was really a shock to me to realize that this fact of bereavement, that my actual sorrow was in a mysterious and incomprehensible way, working, operating, doing something, which was going to 
prepare for me, not me for, but for me, a weight of glory, something that I'm going to understand when I get to heaven. And then in verse 18, he goes on and says, Meanwhile, our eyes are fixed, not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. For what is seen passes away. What is unseen is eternal. And one of the hardest things for me about widowhood was the fact that there were a whole lot of seen things around there that were going to pass away, but they hadn't passed away as fast as my husband Jim. What an irony that the house that he had built was still there, but he was gone. Every now and then I would come across something still left in the house which I thought I had gotten rid of because I did set to work very quickly to sort his things, give away his clothes, and get rid of everything that I was sure I wasn't going to need but somebody else might need. But I hadn't really done a 100% job. One day I found a pair of shoes tucked way back in the corner of a closet. I pulled them out and stood there staring at them. There was the shape of his feet, those feet that I had known so well as I knew every inch of that body that was now in a grave on the Kodurai River. And it was as if a dagger stabs my heart each time I see something like that. I would open a book and find a notation of his in a margin with his handwriting, and I would think his hand was on that page. Well, I don't want to get maudlin, but I hope that I'm ringing a few bells out there. Some of you know what I mean. There are all those little reminders, the things that he had made, the things that he had used, his Bible, his pen, his notebooks, his diaries, his clothes, reminders of what I have lost. Paul says, fix your eyes not on the things that are seen, but on the things that are unseen. Why? because the things that are seen are not going to last very long. The things that are unseen are going to last forever. Maybe the things which are seen right now, for some of you, are your kitchen, your laundry room, your child. Maybe your child is screaming right now. Maybe he's just spilled the milk or the applesauce or rubbed the applesauce in his hair or on your best dress. Those are things seen, aren't they? And those can be trials, believe me, I know. Our troubles are slight and short-lived, and their outcome and eternal glory, what? Outcome of something like this? This disaster in the kitchen, this overflowing washing machine, this flat tire? What are you talking about, I can hear you saying. Their outcome can be an eternal glory if you look at them in light of the eternal, of the invisible. Even these little things, these troubles which most of us would admit are slight, the slight things as well as the things which look big to us, their outcome can be an eternal glory if we fix our eyes on the things which are unseen. When you look at that little child, what do you see? Well, if he's peacefully asleep with his golden curls on the pillow or his little black kinky curls on the pillow... He looks like a little angel, doesn't he? So sweet. You just want to eat him. And that same little golden-haired or kinky-haired child, can't he be a little devil the next day? The things which are seen. Do you remember that you are raising that child for God, not just for you? God has given you a job for eternity in raising that child. And there will be, if you offer up to him, all the sufferings that that child causes, all the little troubles, all the anger, all the impatience, if you will offer it up to God, there will be a weight of glory. Don't ever forget that that little child has a halo. He was sent to you by God. And Jesus says, if you receive one of these little ones in my name, you receive me. And so I went back to my work in the jungle, to taking care of my baby and teaching my Indians, to cleaning the house and cleaning the lawn and the pineapple patch, to delivering babies and giving shots of penicillin. And I did the next thing, asking God to help me to do it for him. 
My daughter was fatherless. I had to be a single parent. I've had people say to me, how could you be both mother and father to your daughter? My answer was, I couldn't. God had taken her father. I had to be her mother. Do the next thing. And do it remembering that if that thing is offered to God, it can be transformed into something eternal. It will contribute to that weight of glory, which is going to far outweigh the worst troubles that you have ever experienced here in this life. And one of the things which God seemed to be saying to me was, write a biography. I suddenly realized that I had a treasure trove in Jim's diaries. And I had said to Jim a few months before he died, you know, this is good stuff. One of these days I might write your biography. And so there was a seed planted in my mind, maybe I would do that. And when he died, I thought, could that be the next thing with all I've got to do? Well, Lord, you're going to have to help me, just as he had to help me with all the other things that I had to do on that station. But I offered them to him. I said, Lord, it's your work. I'm your servant. It's your glory that I'm aiming for. Help me. That was Gateway to Joy 100, A Weight of Glory. We'll also hear from Eileen Chambers, longtime friend, a screenwriter, and somebody who's been working with Valerie in connection with her book, Devotedly. Hi there. My name is Eileen Chambers, and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to talk to you about one of my heroes of the faith, Elizabeth Elliot. Many moons ago, too many to count, when I was a young believer, by some fluke, I ended up going to a women's conference outside of Los Angeles where Elizabeth was the featured speaker. I remember being rather surprised at the size of the crowd. And as I sat down in one of the last seats near the back of this huge college auditorium, I wondered who was this woman that all these other women gave up their precious weekend to hear? Little did I know that my life was about to be changed forever. What were my first impressions? Well, when Elizabeth walked to the podium, she had this air of confidence and authority that made you want to sit up straight. Like a mama who knew very well that you took the last two cookies out of the cookie jar. She wore a simple bow in her hair and dressed in what I'd call just classic feminine. No, it was really clear right from the start there was not one ounce of Hollywood in her. Good gracious, she even had a gap in between her teeth. But as Elizabeth began to speak, it became crystal clear to me why these women had sacrificed their precious weekend. For you see, Elizabeth Elliot was the real deal. She loved Jesus Christ with her whole heart. She loved his word and teaching out of it. She loved the adventure that walking with him entailed. She lived through heartbreak and suffering and found, as she would always say, the gateway to joy in the process. I'll never forget her saying at that conference that she had never said no to Jesus Christ. And to be honest, my first thought was, what? Come on, that's hard to believe. But now, many decades later, after having the honor of meeting her in person, after reading all her books and studying her life quite intensely, I can tell you from the bottom of my heart, she was not lying. Rather, I think in that moment she was trying to impress upon the audience and this young believer way in the far back that it was possible to live a life completely surrendered to God. Eileen Chambers, longtime friend. Well, it looks as though our podcast is coming to an end. Thanks for letting us come into your life, whether at home, at the office, as you jog, or wherever you happen to be. It's good to have you with us. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you back again next time. And why not check out all the resources available at elizabethelliott.org. elizabethelliott.org. A lot of work has been put into this website, and and hopefully you'll check it out if you haven't already. elizabethelliott.org. Until next time, may God remind you daily you are loved with an everlasting love. And underneath are what? That's right, the 
everlasting arms.